Greetings, everyone, and welcome to another Comic Book Wednesday video. Uh, today, I'm going to be doing the first of a, well, I guess a three-part series uh, that I've been wanting to do for a really long time. Now, I've talked about these before in update videos and whatnot, uh, but I, I really wanted to kind of focus on them a little bit more and talk about why I like them so much and what, uh, you know, what, what I think is so great about them. I'm, of course, talking about... Mike Grell's take on Green Arrow. So today we're going to start with the Longbow Hunters, which was the mini series that kicked off his his run, and then Volume One, Hunter's Moon, which contains the first six issues of the regular series. So Green Arrow by Mike Grell today on the Multimedia Chronicles. Welcome back. Uh, so, but just a little bit of background. My personal introduction to Green Arrow was, of course, through the comics of the 70s. Uh, I, picked, I got a couple when I was a kid, and I don't remember, from some relatives or something. So, first up, we have, of course, an issue of Green Lantern and Green Arrow. These are very well-loved, as you will see. Uh, I did a nice high-res scan of the cover for you there, and yeah, you you can see how how loved it is. <laughs> Funny enough, everybody talks about Denny O'Neill's uh, famous run on this, and I've actually talked about it before myself. I did a big video about uh, one of the collected editions of that a while back. Um, I'll include a link to that in the description, by the way, in case you want to check it out. Or actually, you can check it out right here. Hey, you can put links in the videos, so why don't I just do that instead of making you work for it? Yeah, anyway... Um, so yeah, I, I kind of missed the that particular run back in the day. I just had this issue, this is issue number 101, uh, which is just barely past the end of when Denny O'Neill stopped. And also, funny enough, uh, Mike Grell was the regular artist on this shortly before this issue. So I was almost introduced to Mike Grell's Green Arrow very, very early, at least as far as uh, drawing it goes. Um, yeah, so kind of cool. My other introduction, I don't remember which one came first. This one, I think, was... was Well, I guess I can check the dates on them. This was 19... This was 1978, and this one... 1975. Okay, so I guess my real introduction to Green Arrow was this one. Issue 4 of The Joker, The Clown Prince of Crime. Yes, not many of you may know this, but back in the mid-70s, The Joker got his own bi-monthly book. And it ran for nine issues. There was, I just found out today, actually, they, they did a reprint edition of this with all nine issues in a trade paperback. So uh, needless to say, I will be picking that up very, very soon. Um, and as you can see from the cover there, this one is even more well-loved. <laughs> I guess I would have been three when I first got this comic. A uh, little bit early to appreciate them, but, uh, you know, they were definitely appreciated in my later years when I, you know, learned to read. But, uh, but yeah, good stuff, good stuff. So, anyway, Green Arrow's in both of those. Really enjoyed the character. Um, always liked Robin Hood and that sort of thing. So, to me, having sort of a Robin Hood superhero, which is basically what Green Arrow is in these, uh, was super cool. So, fast forward to 1988, or I guess it was 80, was it 87? Sorry, 1987. Yes, 1987. Uh, two years after The Dark Knight Returns, which uh, I talked about, I don't know, on a few, I think I've talked about it in my recent Killing Joke review. But um, The Dark Knight Returns was a big influential comic for DC and just for comics in general because it took some of these classic characters and gave them a more adult spin. Plus, it was published in this beautiful square-bound deluxe Format. So DC, obviously not wanting to pass on a potential cash cow, started producing more such prestige format miniseries. Uh, there was a few over the years. I collected a bunch of them, just whatever I could get my hands on. I just really liked the format and found that they were doing some really interesting things with it. You know, they had Jim Starlin's Gil Gilgamesh 2. Uh, you had Superman, the Earth Stealers. You had uh, The Prisoner was brought back as a, as a three-issue mini or four-issue miniseries in that format. Uh, the, the, I'm talking about the 60s uh, spy series. Uh, great stuff. So there's some really interesting things. So anyway, 1987, 
they put out Green Arrow, the Longbow Hunters. Now, the Longbow Hunters came about as a suggestion by editor, uh, DC Comics editor Mike Gold, who had been talking to Mike Grell about some potential projects. And uh, Mike Grell had been wanting to do Batman for a long time, and that just didn't seem to be happening. Uh, he was off doing his own thing for First Comics, doing, uh, I think it was John Sable Freelance and stuff like that. So Mike Gold uh, approached him and said, you know, you've had uh, some pretty good runs on D with uh, DC, like with Warlord and stuff like that. Uh, he was the regular artist on uh, Green Lantern, Green Arrow for a long time. And uh, he said, what do you think of maybe returning to one of your uh, previous goateed heroes? So Mike Gold, in his introduction for the uh, trade paperback collection of the Longbow Hunters, talks about how he was always surprised by the fact that Green Arrow was such a popular character over the years. I mean, he'd been around since 1941, but had never had his own monthly series. There had been a miniseries. He'd, you know, been part of the Green Lantern, Green Arrow duo, but he'd never had his own series. So he was talking to... Uh, I think it was Dick Giordano, the uh, then editor-in-chief of DC. Let me just quickly confirm that here. Yes, it was Dick Giordano. So he approached Mike Grell and said, uh, you know, I was talking to uh, you know Dick Giordano and we've been kind of bouncing around some ideas of reviving some of these DC characters that haven't really had a chance to shine in the spotlight for a while. And uh, got to thinking maybe you'd like to do a Green Arrow series. But here's the thing. We're thinking do it more as Green Arrow as an urban hunter rather than as, you know, a superhero uh, with the trick arrows and everything. And, uh, yeah, Mike Grell was intrigued by that idea. So they had some meetings and bounced some ideas around. And long, make a long story short, came up with what we have in the Longbow Hunters. So... In Green Arrow, the Longbow Hunters, we have a middle-aged Oliver Queen who is uh, having a bit of a midlife crisis, actually. <laughs> he's uh, in his early 40s. I think he's 43 at the time of the uh, story. He actually has his birthday in the middle of it, so they make it very clear how old he is. Uh, he and Dinah Lance are together. They've moved to San Francisco, and they've set up a, sh a flower shop called Sherwood Florist. Interestingly enough, Dinah does have a flower shop in this issue of The Joker. It's not Sherwood Florist, though, and I think it's still in Star City. But, uh, yeah, so they set up their own flower shops, kind of running their business. You know, flower shop by day, crime fighters by night. And, uh, yeah, so... Oliver, with his birthday and turning 43 and such, is just kind of reflecting on his life and thinking how, you know, I, I, he really wants to have kids and, and settle down and such. And they do a bit of role reversal here because it's always, you always hear the stories of the, the, the guy saying to the woman, like, no, I can't, can't settle down and have kids. I got to think about my career. Well, in this case, it's the other way around. It's actually Dinah who says that because, I mean, she's a lawyer, but she's also Black Canary by night. And she's very reluctant about that. I mean, she loves Oliver and, and whatnot, but she doesn't want to risk having a child with the kind of lifestyle that they lead. I mean, anything could happen to them. I mean, it's even worse than if they were cops, you know, it's the same kind of dynamic, but they're superheroes and they're in very dangerous situations all the time, especially when you start to dive into the urban world that Longbow Hunters is set in. It's basically done very gritty, very dark, very realistic. This is not Green Arrow using trick arrows fighting supervillains. This is Green Arrow going back to basics, using nothing but a longbow and really sharp, deadly arrows and taking it to the streets. This is him fighting the urban element, uh, gangs, drug dealers, mob bosses, a uh, little bit of international intrigue here and there as well. Uh, sometimes other vigilantes that show up in the city and he has to deal with it, just going around indiscriminately killing people or or not necessarily indiscriminately, but he has to find out what they're what they're there for. I mean, are they there for a purpose? Are they, are they just killing indiscriminately? You know, he has to figure these things out. But, uh, and that's the kind of where, where we come in is they're just setting up shop in San Francisco, new city, new life, and getting back to basics. So in the Longbow Hunters, I should mention, uh, I do have the Longbow Hunters. Ta-da! There we go. There's the first issue. Second issue. Third issue, 
bagged and boarded, as you can see. Um, I do have cover scans of the beautiful cover art, so let's just take a look at that while I tell you a little bit about uh, what it's all about. So in addition to the midlife crisis stuff, there's also a few other things going on in town which Oliver kind of gets involved in. One of which is there's a serial killer going around killing hookers. So that's something he's uh, investigating and trying to get to the bottom of. The other thing is there's another vigilante in town, well, the aforementioned other vigilantes. Um, someone who's killing people with um, a bow and arrow. And very skillfully. So needless to say, Oliver is uh, one of the prime suspects in this. So he not only has to prove his innocence, he has to figure out who this person is and what their motivation is and why they're killing people if there's any pattern to it. Um, as it turns out, the killer in question is actually Shadow, who those of you who watch Arrow may be somewhat familiar with. I was really excited when I saw Shadow show up in Arrow. Um, I've only seen the first two seasons of Arrow, so I don't know if there has been more with her character since. Uh, however, in the show, they really kind of tamed down her character. In the Longbow Hunters, she is a trained assassin for the Yakuza. Uh, basically, her mission is to restore her family's honor after her father betrayed the Yakuza. And uh, she's been brought up since she was a child to be the perfect assassin. And uh, extremely skilled with the bow and arrow, basically a ninja. And uh, yeah, and she wear wears the tattoo of a red dragon on her arm. And the red dragon, while it looks really cool, is apparently a symbol of dishonor. So... She has to live with that mark forever and clear her uh, family's honor with the Yakuza. So that's basically the, the, the gist. You get her story over the course of the, uh, of the thing as Oliver kind of uncovers it. Well, Oliver doesn't actually uncover all of it. It's more just kind of told to us, the readers. And Oliver is uh, kind of left in the dark about a lot of aspects of her past and whatnot. But uh, really interesting dynamic between those two characters. And... Um, I really like uh, the whole story arc involving Shadow. That that story basically begins here, and it carries on throughout the regular series which follow. There's quite a few uh, stories involving Shadow uh, over the course of the regular series. But uh, we'll talk about those when we get to them. So, yeah. So Dinah, uh, Black Canary, uh, decides to investigate some things on her own and ends up getting captured uh, by some very twisted people. Uh, one guy in particular who's basically a, a completely sick, twisted, sadistic fuck. <laughs> and uh, he, he basically strings her up and, he, and is cutting her. And I mean, she's almost like in a crucified position, kind of like, you know, uh, arms out and legs out and uh, uh, clothes slashed, almost naked. And uh, there's a lot of controversy about that when uh, when the comic originally came out. A lot of uh, parents groups were, you know, up in arms. Social justice warriors of their day. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's funny because the, the, the late 80s, early 90s were kind of uh, a time for a lot of uh, outrage about media. And were kind of the impetus for why we have ratings now for comics for video games and for tv shows at the time we didn't there was nothing i mean the only indication uh that comics would give would be voluntary on the part of the publishers so for example the the regular green arrow comic carried a banner that said suggested for mature readers and that was that um i just realized how uh long we're going here i don't think we're going to get to volume one today so we'll just finish up with the longbow hunters and then we'll call it a day we'll do volume one next time but, uh, yeah, so anyhow, the, that sequence was, was not just meant to be gratuitous. It was meant to serve a purpose, one of which was they were trying to get everything down to the basics, just the, the basic uh, you know, combat and crime-fighting skills that these two characters had, investigative skills, without any superpowers, without any trick arrows, nothing like that. Just get it down to basics and let them use their actual skills to deal with these situations. So, in the case of Dinah Lance, Black Canary, the reason she was put through that horrible trauma was, A, to set up some wonderful story arcs to come in, in, the, uh, in the regular series. I mean, she would be dealing with that trauma fairly regularly throughout the, the series which followed, um, and it just 
you know, provided a great uh, starting point for a lot of quality drama, but also because they wanted her to, to suffer something so terrible that it would essentially rob her of her, uh, you know, her canary screams powers. Like, I forget what they call it, the, the sonic scream thing. You know what I mean, the black canary's screaming power. Yeah, so she doesn't have that in this. Now, funny thing is, a bit of a contradiction here, because while this was going on in San Francisco, at the same time, Black Canary was part of the Justice League, and... Uh, apparently there's a serial killer out there dismembering bodies. Anyway, um, yeah, apparently they did deal with that in later issues. They did have some more Black Canary-focused stories that kind of uh, dealt with that. But again, we'll talk about those when we get to them. So, long and the short of it is, um, let me just show you a few sort of key moments here that I, I really enjoy about the Longbow Hunters. So, yeah, I mean, as for, as for the violence, you can see here, for example, right in the, one of the opening scenes, the uh, aforementioned serial killer basically uh, killing a, a hooker, kind of Jack the Ripper style. And, uh, yeah, so that's one aspect of it. Uh, we also get sort of a reworking of the origin of Oliver Queen where he uh, he talks about how as a kid he really liked Robin Hood and archery <laughs> they're rebuilding our balconies so don't mind that and uh, fans of Arrow will find this familiar basically his time spent uh, alone on a desert island and learning to survive and honing his hunting skills uh, a lot of what you see in Arrow is actually derived from the Mike Grell years so if you like Arrow you're probably gonna like this yeah and then here he's just kind of reminiscing about the good old days where he was the superhero Robin Hood and talking about the trick arrows and stuff like that and it just goes on and on and on kind of reminiscing it's it's kind of it's acknowledging the past but also setting things up for the direction that it's going to go in and I gotta say I love Mike Grell's uh, sense of mood and uh, almost cinematic style of visual storytelling here. So here, for example, is, you know, they've just made love and they're basically laying in bed, just kind of talking. And this is one of the big moments, wow, that's annoying, uh, where <laughs> Oliver is talking about how he uh, wants to have kids. And in the crucial response, we cut to this just beautiful black and white rendering where you can almost, you can see, uh, you know the the brush strokes and the the canvas and whatnot uh, behind the paint uh, as she says that she doesn't want to have kids and uh and, and just this the, this very you know morose moment where all she falls asleep in his arms and oliver's just kind of left alone with his thoughts uh, there's a lot of beautiful just little simple moments like that in this that uh that i really like holy shit that's so annoying um so here, here's an example of when Oliver goes out and becomes the back to basics urban hunter again. Basically, uh, stops this this uh, little group of street thugs terrorizing an elderly couple, and uh, and deals with them. And this part I just love is when the um, police are questioning the elderly couple and the thugs as to who this guy was that helped them, and we have <laughs> the thugs interpretation. Where he says, yeah, man, he was, and with the biggest, and <laughs> he's saying the sketch of just this demon from hell. And then uh, the old lady is like, well, he was with a nice and a really great, and we see her, <laughs> we see like this picture of Errol Flynn as Robin Hood, you know, and it's, it's great. I just love little moments like that. Holy fuck, that's annoying. And then here, uh, just give you a look at Shadow there. Very, very cool character. Really like uh, how she was developed. And just looking, you know, cinematics here. The Some of the flashbacks of Shadow being trained as a child. Just beautiful, beautiful artwork and really interesting panel layouts. Mike Grell likes to do very interesting panel layouts for his, his stuff. Like here, for example, we even have like a circle rather than the standard square. And things like that it's very very interesting and here for example we see the juxtaposition of her learning to shoot an arrow as a child versus uh, now when she's actually executing somebody so very and again just a really interesting panel layout and a, a really cool juxtaposition between the past and the present 
so one of the recurring themes is uh, every time that uh, they meet up, he, he's trying to maintain a very strict moral code of no killing. And her take on it is, well, you know, there, there will be a time when you'll find that you'll have to kill. You don't have the eyes of a killer, but you have it in you to be a killer. And uh, so that's kind of a recurring thematic element. And uh, yeah, so I'll just show you a little bit here of when uh, Dinah is captured. I mean, it's not full nudity. It's basically just artwork of, uh, you know, the blood and whatnot. But you can see, you know, we get like little little moments of almost sketch style artwork here to emphasize certain emotions or certain uh, impactful moments. And uh, yeah, and it's just just fantastic. I mean, I could go on and on and on about this. Well, I, I already have gone on and on and on about it. But uh, suffice it to say, I mean, there's very powerful, dramatic, uh, violent moments and just um, and just some amazing surreal moments as well. Just absolutely fantastic stuff. So in short, read this. You will not be disappointed. <laughs> Even though it was done in 1987, honestly, I think it holds up phenomenally well. And uh, it, it, a lot of the... You know, sort of social aspects and societal aspects of it really haven't changed that much, to be perfectly honest. Uh, occasionally, you'll see little things mentioned that are clearly of the 80s, but for the most part, it, it I mean, it, it feels like a modern comic and a modern story. And um, it's just so well written, and the characters are so well developed, and the artwork is just absolutely beautiful. So, Green Arrow, The Longbow Hunters, Amazon link in the description. Check it out, you will not be disappointed. So next time, we will talk about Volume 1, Hunter's Moon, I promise. Uh, until then, thanks for watching. Alrighty. Quick thank you to my Patreon sponsors. Special big thanks to Kyle Pellegrin and Get Your Gorgeous On, my two highest level sponsors. And we'll see you next time. Until then, thanks for watching, and sayonara. So DC obviously not wanting to look again. Uh, so DC obviously not want to pass on a potential cash. Yeah. And um, yeah. So anyway, Mike Gold approached him and said, uh, you know, I, I was thinking, you know, with uh, DC, you, you've had a lot of luck with, uh, you know, uh, Warlord and and stuff like that, and you were the. Uh, bleh. So Mike Gold got to talking to him and said, uh, "Yeah, I know. You know, uh, you've had a lot of luck with DC with uh, you know Warlord for for that. Yeah, holy shit! And th this part, like, what the fuck are you doing? Wow, that really just derails my fucking train of thought. It's so annoying." Shoot me, uh, Shadow and Green Arrow. Holy fuck, I'm gonna like put my fist through something.